Hi, I'm Gautam Nair, a postdoc in Arjun Raj's lab in the Department of Bioengineering at Penn. For the past few years, we have been studying gene transcription in the early stages of embryonic development of a particular type of worm. This started with Arjun's postdoctoral work, in which he and his collaborators investigated what may cause the random mortality of certain mutant strains. In our most recent work on the worm, we collaborated with Travis Walton and John Murray from the Department of Genetics to study how the dynamics of gene transcription are related to the timing of cell divisions. This is a classic question in developmental biology. The results of our study have just been published in the journal Development in a paper titled, Gene Transcription is Coordinated with but Not Dependent on Cell Divisions During C. elegans Embryonic Fate Specification. My main goal in this slidecast is that you have a clear idea of what we mean by this title, what the claims are, and what their scope is. First, we claim that gene transcription is coordinated with cell divisions. By this we mean that the transcription start time of genes and the timing of cell divisions appear to closely track each other, even when we experimentally change the rate at which the embryo develops. One way for the organism to enforce such coordination is if transcription was dependent on cell divisions. We tested this and found that this is not so. If you do something to the worm embryo that specifically interferes with cell divisions, let's say it delays the cell division, that does not directly cause a delay in transcription. Our data supports these simple black and white claims within the scope of our study. We restricted our study to genes that are tissue-specific transcription factors. These are genes that implement cell fate directives like instructing cells to become gut or muscle cells, and they do so by controlling the transcription levels of other genes. Also, for various reasons, including experimental limitations, we focused our study on the 10 to 100 cell stage of development. Finally, our system is the nematode worm Cenorhabditis elegans. The worm's admittedly somewhat unique life cycle has offered many advantages to researchers interested in the genetic study of development. The result is that so much is now known about the basics of its development that we're in a good position to ask finer questions, including questions of dynamics. Also, our main tool in this study was high-resolution light microscopy. It was very convenient that the worm embryo is small and transparent. If you want to learn more about developmental dynamics in other contexts, please look at some of the references in our paper. In what remains of this slidecast, we'll work through the experimental evidence in the paper. Our study relied heavily on two complementary techniques that are under active development in the Raj and Murray labs. On the one side, RNA fish gets us accurate gene transcript counts. For RNA fish, we must first fix and permeabilize the embryos. We can then count the number of cells using a nuclear DAPI stain. And after some image processing, we determine the location and count of every transcript of genes that we've probed with our RNA fish stain. We combine the data from this fixed embryo technique with data from live embryo automated lineaging. We recorded movies of C. elegans embryos that express GFP or RFP histone fusion and use these movies to reconstruct accurate cell division lineages for each strain we studied. When you put these two techniques together, you can get something like what you see here. N3, N1, and L2 are three genes involved in making the C. elegans intestine, and they only express in the so-called E cells of the embryo. Automated lineaging gave us timing and lineage information, including the cell division diagram you see above, and RNA fish gave us the trajectories of gene transcripts against embryo cell number. Older embry embryos have undergone more cell divisions, so the x-axis axis is a bit like a time axis. Here we have a typical example of a developmental gene cascade. N3 helps activate N1, and both of them together activate L2. The data you see is for wild-type embryos grown at 20 degrees C, the standard conditions used in labs across the globe. This project started when we pondered the fact that C. elegans embryos can develop successfully under a range of conditions, even though those conditions can dramatically affect the speed of development. Take a look at how much slower the cell divisions go if the worms are grown at 15 degrees C. We wondered what effect such a metabolic slowdown has on transcription. 
Here's the transcription trajectory for L2 again under standard conditions. At 15C, the cell divisions go slower. If transcription dynamics are less sensitive to temperature than the cell cycles, the green curve should advance relative to cell divisions and move to the left. If gene expression is more sensitive, it should move to the right. If it is just as sensitive, it would not move at all. Now, no two chemical reactions are equally sensitive to temperature, so we didn't expect this scenario, but this turned out to be what we found. Look at how closely the trajectory for 15 degrees C growth overlaps with the standard trajectory. We repeated this for several genes, including those involved in the muscle determination pathway. More importantly, we repeated it for worms with a mutation that slows down their development, and found the same result as when we slowed them down by temperature. Every time, transcriptional dynamics track the slowdown in cell division dynamics. This is what we mean when we say that transcriptional dynamics are coordinated with cell divisions in the embryo. You can look in the paper for additional details. In the second part of the paper, we tried to contribute something towards an explanation of the coordination phenomenon we had just seen. So let's take a look at the L2 transcription trajectory again. Here it is, and we've also marked the time of cell divisions in the E-cell lineage, which are the cells that express L2. You'll notice that transcription of this gene starts just a bit after the two E cells each divide. When we slow the embryo's entire metabolism down, the divisions occur later, and the transcription start also occurred proportionately later. An easy mechanism to get this kind of coordination would be that L2 transcription waits for the 2E to 4E divisions no matter what. We'd say that L2 is then dependent on the 2E divisions. We were able to easily test this hypothesis because researchers in the late 70s isolated a mutant strain of worms in which only the cell divisions in the E cell lineage are delayed. The mutated gene is most likely a cell cycle regulator and shouldn't directly interfere with transcription. This means that if L2 transcription is indeed dependent on the 2E divisions, we expect its start time to be delayed in the mutant. We did the experiment and we actually saw the opposite, if anything. L2 came on before the 2E divisions when those divisions were selectively delayed. This is how we concluded that gene transcription is not dependent on cell divisions. It turned out to be possible to do similar experiments for the muscle-related genes HLH1 and UNC120. And again, they were not dependent on cell divisions. In wild-type, trans transcription starts at the same time as the divisions labeled with these uh, multicolored diamonds you see. But in Div1 mutants, that delay those divisions, as you can see, transcription starts too early. So now we're back at the title again. There is coordination, but it is not because transcription is dependent on cell divisions. Neither is it because cell divisions are dependent on transcription. There is good evidence in the literature to the contrary. One remaining option is fine-tuning, that the chemical reaction networks involved in gene expression and cell cycling are almost equally sensitive to metabolic perturbations without any explicit coordination mechanism between them. Another option is that the gene expression network and the cell cycle are taking their timing cues from some other process that sets a kind of global pace. Fact is, we can't know right now. There is a lot still left to learn about gene expression dynamics during development. If you have some thoughts on the matter, we'd be happy to hear them. I hope you've enjoyed this slidecast.